I thought we'd start, we'll talk a bit about your book, but I thought we'd start with a, a bit of a conversation about Iran. It's so much in the news. Um, both the Saudis and our government have said that, that the Iranians have you know, a, a attacked two tankers. Uh, they've since um, uh, shot down a drone of ours. We've upped our deployments or authorized a, a number 2,500 more. Um, what's the end game? Well, it, it's hard to tell. I think uh, for Iran, the end game is to be a regional power, to have a presence in the Persian Gulf region of Persia, mm -hmm. traditional empire of Persia, to have a level. I don't think they want hegemony, but I think they want a role that is in keeping with how they view a population of 80 million people, significant uh, resources and power in that region that has not been available to them really since the departure of the Shah, 1978. So I think that they are trying to get breathing space. They are trying to get uh, a certain amount of leverage over part or over neighbors, such as it they've done in Lebanon, yep. inside uh, parts of Israel, certainly in Syria and Iraq and Yemen now. Yep. So they're trying to do a number of things to give themselves stature and position, which also includes, of course, trying to become a nuclear power. Mm -hmm. and, and what about ours? Well, it, it, it's hard to tell. During most of my career, our objectives could really be boiled down to the free flow of oil. Because if you think about it, 1973, the first oil shock, I was a cadet at West Point, and it really went at our very psyche. Almost everyone here will remember it. It was like someone had grabbed our windpipe and our freedom was gasoline. And then the idea that we could have people in a region limit our access to that. And of course, during that time, our oil production was declining and yeah. we thought it was a, uh, a very finite resource. Then most of my career was spent in some way or another focused on ensuring the free flow of oil through the Persian Gulf. The thing is, it's different now. The United States is actually, essentially, energy independent. Yeah. So getting a mother in Ohio to be excited about sending her son or daughter-in-law or daughter to defend the free flow of oil, while it's still important for the world, isn't for us, is going to be a harder sell. So articulating what our goals for that region are is a lot more complex. Yeah. Now, there are those who, who would advocate, and I'm not, I'm not counting the president in this, yeah. uh, there are those who are advocating regime change. Um, and I guess my question is, can we afford it when you've got Yemen, a horrifying war in Yemen, still war in Syria, in Syria, Iraq is not totally stabilized. Can we afford that in the region? You mean regime change in Iran? Yeah. Um, well, first... <laughs> First off, there's a I was level... I say, there's some, there some folks debating uh, yeah. next week that want regime change here. There, but there's no. a level of arrogance in the term regime change. I remember when I was commanding in Afghanistan, people would come to me and they'd, visitors from outside, and they'd say, well, should we change out Hamid Karzai? And I'd say, well, <laughs> he was elected. And we don't have the authority or, or the moral right to just regime change. So our ability to reach into a, a place like Iran and, and be talking about regime change really needs to be sort of thought through. Now, what we should be talking about is behavior change. Mm -hmm. There are behaviors that Iran does that I would argue are internationally unacceptable. I think their, their activities in Yemen, their activities with Hamas, their activities inside with Lebanese Hezbollah, their, their actions inside Syria, and certainly the ones that I fought against in Iraq were unacceptable. And those should be contested and those should even be combated directly. But I don't think it's our place because Iran, whether it's flawed or not, is a democracy. They vote in their leadership. And so I think it's, uh, I think it's important for us to decide what it is is within our uh, international frame of, of what we can and cannot do. And we can certainly pursue our interests. And it's a relatively stable country. It with is. An educated uh, It's very educated. Actually, if you go and 
uh, poll the Iranian people, the United States and Americans are more popular with Iranians than we are in most of the other countries in that region. And so there's, there is clearly, that's not the case at the Supreme Leader in the, the inner circles of the government, but that with a lot of that population. So there's, there's always been this sort of one third, one third, one third construct. People say one third supports the regime, one third supports a new way, and one third's kind of in the middle. I'm not sure that that's a perfectly accurate, mm -hmm. but it certainly should give us cause to think about. And as we deal with Iran, things that would unite them toward the hard end, supporting the supreme leader, are probably not in the interests of uh, stability or peace. Yeah, yeah. Now, um, you mentioned their desire for Iran, for nuclear weapons, yeah. nuclear, um, yeah. the, they, they put that off. I mean, they agreed to postponing for at least 10 years. They mm -hmm. agreed to the removal of, of new, significant amount of nuclear weapons material. Were we smart to pull out? In my personal opinion, no. Yeah. I don't have access to all the details anymore. Um, but in my personal opinion, no. But let's just back it up and say, why do the Iranians want nuclear weapons? Well, why wouldn't they? I mean, if you think about it, there's a, we started the nuclear club and during the Second World War, we developed atomic weapons. And then every country that has gotten nuclear weapons has essentially moved into a circle of greater respect in the world. They certainly get greater consideration. They may not be respected for it or appreciated for it, but they get treated differently. And if we look at the single well-known case of somebody giving up, abandoning a nuclear program, and that's Colonel Gaddafi, yeah. didn't work out well. So I think that the lesson for the average Iranian, and if I was the average Iranian, I would want my country to be a nuclear power. It's a rational desire. They are in a better position if they get that. I think they also very rationally made the decision to cut a deal with us to at least delay that because they thought it was in their interest to get back into the world order in a way economically yeah. and whatnot. Made a lot of sense to them. But we shouldn't consider the pursuit of nuclear weapons by the Iranians to be an aberrant move by a crazy regime. It's a rational foreign policy decision. So let me take you to the part of the world where you spent a good deal of time, and that's Afghanistan. It was back in sure. 2009. You oversaw, what, 150,000 troops from how many countries? Uh, 46. 46 countries. There's no problem coordinating a 46-nation coalition. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to compare that to interagency cooperation. But yeah. uh, so, so you have real experience herding cats. Um, and know the importance of interoperability, the importance of having that capacity. Talk a little bit about that experience and it, what, what was hard about it, what, what really worked about it, what made it an essential approach. Yeah, I, I got to uh, Afghanistan to take command in June of 2009, but I had first been assigned to Afghanistan in 2002, yes. and then I had been there for part of every year after that because the counter-terrorist forces that I was a part of Part of our force was in Afghanistan. So I probably spent two months at least of every year in Afghanistan as we prosecuted operations across the regime or across the region. When I got to Afghanistan in 2009, it's important. We, we did this study and I did a listening tour around the country, talked to a tremendous number of people, and I was struck by a number of things. The point in time of 2009 was Afghanistan had begun its torturous path into instability, really in 1973. And then in 1979, the Soviets intervened Christmas Day, and it began an almost 10-year Soviet interaction. During that 10 years when the Soviets were there, what happened was they were trying to support the movement of a progressive socialist-leaning government, which on the surface of it made a lot of sense. It supported women's rights. It was progressive in many ways, but it was antithetical to the more conservative parts of Afghan society. And it wasn't all Islam related, it was also just culture. So the Soviets ended up involved in a bitter war with their uh, Democratic Republic of Afghanistan allies or client state. And during that period, 1.2 million Afghans were killed. 
Now you stop and you go, wow, that's, that's incredible. That's a lot more people than we think of. We remember U.S. supplied stingers shooting down Soviet helicopters and then the Soviets leaving sort of in disgrace and another Vietnam idea. Actually, 1.2 million Afghans were killed. And at the end of that, the United States, which had provided weapons and money and other support through Pakistani authorities, largely the ISI, the, the intelligence organizations, Pakistan, had funneled it to the Mujahideen groups, of which there were seven, and they had, they had won. And so the United States, I mean, I'm simplifying it a little bit, spiked the football and said, OK, we won. They had their Vietnam, and we're leaving. And we, we really sort of backed off from Afghanistan. Inside the Afghan uh, environment, what happened was, first, the Afghan people computed it a little differently. We, we patted ourselves on the back and said, look, we helped them win. They owe us a thanks. Remember Rambo 3? We sent Rambo over there, and, and he helped. Uh, <laughs> But they processed it differently. They say, yeah, you gave us some weapons, you gave us some money, and we did all the fighting. We fought your Cold War opponent. You never fought the Russians during the entire Cold War. We fought them for a decade and lost 1.2 million people. And then the day it's over, you walk. Now, you can't say one perspective is right and the other's wrong, but you can say both of them are legitimate and both were deeply held. And then we didn't come back. We, we left, and Afghanistan broke down in this bitter civil war. First, the seven Mujahideen groups fought amongst each other with incredible brutality. And then the Taliban movement arose, sort of like zealous young men who are sick of that, and they're going to sweep it clean. And then that's, that continues the civil war, but now in a different way. So in 2001, when we re-enter Afghanistan, We've been gone for essentially 11 years. We come back in. We're going to get rid of al-Qaeda. We topple the Taliban regime, and we're here to help you. And they're calculating, well, okay, where have you been? And then remember, some people would come to me when I was commanding there. They'd say, well, we, we came here because the Afghans asked us. And I would remind them, no, we didn't. We came because Tarnak Farms and the al-Qaeda under Osama bin Laden had used Afghanistan as a training location and a launch point for operations. We went to Afghanistan in 2001 because it was in our interests. And so when we went in, topple the Taliban government, and then there was a case, okay, we will get out right away. The Afghans are going, wait a minute. Now you've overthrown our government. You've thrown us into a, a state of disorder. What do we do? And what happened essentially was the Western nations that went in, the United States more than anyone else, really went in on a pretty slim budget, meaning we put, when I was first there, we had a total of 7,500 troops there in a country of 26 million. You can't cover the city of San Francisco with 7,500 troops. So reality is we couldn't do much, and then we weren't investing much. There was a plan for one nation, the Germans, to uh, help create the police force, the Italians to create a legal system, and we were going to help create an army. But the reality is everything was done on the cheap. In fact, the first weapons we were able to give this new Afghan army that we were trying to stand up was 600 Romanian AK-47s we had talked the Romanians into donating. And you're trying to build an army on that. And so I make this point because things were done much more on the cheap than a lot of people realize. And so for the next, essentially, eight years, as the situation started to deteriorate, about 2003, that the Taliban realized that there wasn't that much support for Hamid Karzai's government. And so about 2003, the Taliban started coming back. And what they would do is they'd go into villages and they would go. Most villages were multi-tribal, not controlled by one tribe. But they would go in and they'd say to a tribe that is not doing well, you're getting screwed. So they'd go to tribes that, that thought they were not getting a fair shake, and they would leverage discontent. And that grew until about 2006, and we had a hot war on our hands again. And then about 2008, by the time I left Special Operations Command, 
I remember one of my last times in, in Afghanistan, it had already gotten pretty rough. We were fighting Taliban in groups of 200 and 250 at a time. I mean, <laughs> knock down, drag out fights. But there was a perception in the United States that Iraq was the, the hot war, the bigger war, and it was. But Afghanistan was sort of forgotten and there wasn't much going on there. But it was getting worse. And so when I got there in 2009, what had happened was Iraq had now settled down, which you remember, and decisions were made to pull out. And Afghanistan is now bubbled up again as a very difficult problem. And many of the 46 nations that came to support the cause in Afghanistan did so because the United States asked them to, not because it was in their interest. The Poles, the Romanians, the highest per capita casualty rate in the force. Americans think, well, Americans are doing the fight and it's us. No, it was Estonia. They were taking a higher percentage of casualties than any other force in the uh, coalition. So, but they had come for peacekeeping because mm -hmm. we'd asked them for peacekeeping and now we're in a hot war. Yeah. And so I tell that whole story because in the summer of 2009, what I found was the Taliban were resurgent, but the biggest problem in the country was a lack of confidence. It was a lack of a crisis of confidence on part of the Afghan government on a part of the Afghan people, on the part of, I wouldn't say the Pakistanis crisis of confidence, but they, they had concluded that America wouldn't stay and therefore the coalition wouldn't. And on a part of the United States, because it had been eight, almost nine years at war. And so there's this crisis of confidence, which starts to make almost every negative thing a reality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that's a long way of getting to what's going to happen in Afghanistan is what the Afghan people is going to decide happens. And that means that if the Afghan people decide that they can bring together some agreement between the Taliban and the existing government and they can get a modus vivendi that is acceptable enough, then I think they'll muddle forward to that. Uh, I personally, if I was going to guess, and I'm not at all confident that I'm right on this, that that's probably what happens. Both sides realize they cannot win mm -hmm. a military victory. Both sides decide that it is terrible for the state to continue it. And so they will move towards an accommodation. But it won't be like a peace. A, you won't come together in a set of meetings and come out with a peace accord and then everything goes forward because there are too many stakeholders that are benefiting both from the status quo or from a different outcome. So I think what happens is you're going to get this rational peace accord, which from thousands of miles away is going to look great, but people up close there, some are going to lose land, some will lose power, some will lose other things. And so you'll have a lot of players trying to knock the, the legs out from under it. And so for the, for the first few years of the peace accord, even if it's a good one, the best that can be crafted, I think we're going to have a bunch of disappointments and frustrations. And we've just got to understand that that's the way it plays when you've now been at 30 plus years yeah. of conflict. Yeah. yeah. And, and a pretty fragile government <laughs> that we have under Ashraf Ghani. I mean, in fact, it, it should be over. His, yeah. his term has been extended so they can have later yeah. elections. How fragile is that government? I, I, I think it's very fragile, except that there's not a real government in waiting. Yeah. So there's not a much better alternative. Ashraf Ghani is a very competent person. He has recently started bringing some young Afghan leaders in around him, to include my former aide de camp, um, who's a brilliant Sandhurst graduate and, and a number of other things. He's starting to bring those around. I really strongly believe, and I know that I'm in the demographic I'm going to talk badly about, but Afghanistan will never really move forward until my generation's gone. It's going to take the young generation. There's too much scar tissue, too much civil war, too much uh, contentiousness among the people who are really about 50 years old and older. Yeah. You're going to need to use the young generation. Unfortunately, we've educated a lot more of them, and I think they do have a different view. Yeah. There's, there's one thing that gives me hope, and you've got to tell me whether I'm right or wrong on this, and that is that um, when they had the three-day ceasefire during, uh, during Ramadan, 
it became apparent that both the, the chain of command worked, both on the Taliban side, that they were able to keep their fighters from fighting, and on the government side, they, the Afghan forces yeah. were also disciplined, and the Afghan public was supportive. Yeah. Should that give me as much hope, as, or I'm, am I grasping at straws? I think you're grasping a little bit. <laughs> uh, but the reality is it's a very positive sign. Yeah. Uh, we started to believe, even when I was there, uh, as long ago as 2010, that the Taliban had fragmented to the point where there wasn't enough unified command to be able to negotiate. Yeah. But clearly, that's an indicator that there may be. And that's very, very positive in my view. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Let me take you to, to one more place, and that's Iraq, because you, you referenced it. Um, and, uh, well, you, your comment about the resources you had available to you in, in Afghanistan are really striking. And I, I guess there's sort of two ways of, two questions that it raises for me. One is, did we try to fight that on the cheap so that we wouldn't have to bring the American public along? Um, I mean, I think there's a lot of a lot of times when we do that um, in our in our own government that they will kind of starve our own effort because we don't want to go through the hard work of getting the public support. But the second is a very strong feeling that resources were diverted to Iraq. Um, certainly, uh, leadership attention was diverted, if not if not resources. Comment on both of those. Yeah, I mean, the reality was, whether it was conscious or whether it happened, resources went to Iraq in a way that was stunning when you actually compared it. By 2004, five and six, and Iraq was probably far uglier than uh, most Americans realized. The level of violence was Mm -hmm. pretty brutal. We had the best we had to offer. As a commander of JSOC, I had two-thirds of JSOC in combat, which is unsustainable because we had a one-third, one-third rotation. And for about eight months, we put two-thirds in the fight because we thought we were going to lose if we didn't. We had the best technology we could find. We had predators. We we built things up to an incredible degree, and we had the best leadership we could field. When, When I got to Afghanistan in 2009, I'd been there for, as I mentioned, for part of every year. But inside my, my special operations force. But when I took over as the, the commander of ISAF, first off, things like the intelligence backbone, the IT backbone, were laughable compared to what we'd created in Iraq. The medevac structure, all the enablers that let you fight a serious fight were probably at about 10% of what was in Iraq although the landmass and the problem wasn't demonstra- that demonstrably different. Mm-hmm. And then the most shocking thing, and this is going to sound terrible, I went to take command of the staff, and we had essentially put the junior varsity in Afghanistan. Most of the staffs were made up of individual augmentees who were not there as a unit or what. Or, and so as a consequence, you didn't have the cohesion, you didn't have the focus. Yeah. Yeah. And it was nobody's fault, but it was just a case of, We were so focused on Iraq and the level of violence had gotten so high that it went there. When I took command, I was able to articulate enough of a a rationale to start changing that and pulling it over because Iraq was getting much better and Afghanistan was getting worse. Uh, But still, we had a long, long way to go. And uh, if if you don't resource an effort like that with talent, number one, and things like language-trained people, you're just on a road to uh, frustration. Yeah, yeah. So there are two things. I mean, you, you lacked the resources and, um, and and the support within Afghanistan. Yeah. And uh, that's that's pretty deadly. Now, I read somewhere that you had, it may have been in your book, that you kept a map of Kabul uh, that had been drawn for the, the, by the British officers in 1842. You kept that map on the wall. Why? Well, I kept it on the little table where we ate, the the small part of my staff and I when we weren't entertained. And I'd had it blown up from a picture, and it was drawn in 1842, and it had the route essentially to Gondamak that the the British forces that had occupied uh, Kabul in 1842 and 1841, they'd been run out in 1842 and slaughtered. And it was this incredible... Uh, tragedy for the Mm -hmm. British Mm -hmm. essentially run out of Afghanistan. And then on that map in 1879, someone had taken a red pen or red 
very careful engineering equipment and drawn the positions for the, the British camp in 1879 when they'd been there, when they'd also had significant issues. And so I kept it, and I still have a copy in my house at home. Um, I kept it on this table because right in the center of where all that was, was where my headquarters was. Mm. In, mm. in 2000, I'd say, everybody, before we feel too confident. Yeah. <laughs> take, take a look. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So this conversation leads us inevitably to a conversation about leadership, which you just happen conveniently to have just written a book on. Or, um, and, and it is a terrific book, by the way, a really, a really great book. What, what had you learned about leadership? After all, you went to West Point. Yeah. That's the whole point. You're taught everything there is to know yeah. about leadership. You'd had all these extraordinary command situations. Um, how did your view of leadership evolve over time? Yeah, significantly. And, and you ask what I'd I learned about leadership. I think I'd learned what I'd been taught. And when I was young, my mother was a very romantic person. She grew up in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and she loved mythology, and she loved stories of Roland and King Arthur and heroes. And so I'd been raised on this. In, in particular, I'd been raised on this one little book, called Greek Myths for Tiny Tots. <laughs> yeah. I still have it, and I read it to my granddaughter. And one of the pictures in it is this guy in a G-string holding up the sky. And you go, wow, that's curious. And, <laughs> but what it was was with Atlas. And the, the mythology was that Atlas held up the sky. And you say, well, that's stupid. No, they lived in an area where, an era where you held something in your hand, and you let it go, it fell to the ground. But the sky was above them, but it didn't fall. So how do you explain that? And so what they came up with was the idea of a very strong guy stands on top of mountains, now called the Atlas Mountains in North Africa, and he held the sky. And that is not as preposterous as we sound when we extrapolate that and we think about how we've thought about leaders in history. We have been devotees to the great woman and great man theory of history. And we still can't let it go. And I was raised on that. I, I went to Stonewall Jackson Elementary School, then I went to Washington Lee High School. <laughs> and for my life, Robert E. Lee was sort of the exemplar of what great leadership was. When I went to West Point, there were statues to great heroes. I lived in Lee Barracks. I took my oath where Lee took it years before. And the idea was that if you do the right, th if you have the right values and you have the right behaviors, you might be a great leader like this. And if you are a great leader, as Thomas Carlyle taught us, you can bend the arc of history. And so we've all more or less been raised to that. When I wrote my memoirs, when I got out of the service, I thought to myself, how hard can this be? Because I was there. So I know. And I got a young man to work with me, and we did incredible number of interviews. And what we found out was my memory of events was actually very accurate. It was good. My understanding of events was pathetic. Because what I thought was something happened, you draw a line back to a decision or action I took, and that's what caused it. And there we go. And some of those I got credit for, some I got blamed for. But I was the star of the show. Then when we did the interviews, we found out that I would have some action that I did. And then there were hundreds of people behind the scenes or below the waterline doing an incredible number of things that typically had more to do with the actual outcome than anything I did. And we didn't really tease that out until we got detailed accounts from all the people, almost like an after action review that SLA Marshall began in World War II. And so what we found was my memoirs to a degree the short view would be mythology the idea that i am the hero of the show just isn't complete and that's dispiriting when you write your memoirs <laughs> so i came to the conclusion that that my understanding of leadership was just dramatically incomplete so when we went to do leaders after all that i'd been taught about leadership had the opportunity to practice known great leaders we wanted to go back to first principles, so we went to Plutarch, the original biographer, 
first century Greek turned Roman citizen who wrote the original biographies of 48 lives, went back and read all thousand pages of Plutarch as he compares great leaders. And then we said, we need to look at leaders now because we don't really understand what it is. What we understand about leadership is the mythology, not the reality. And we do that because we are hardwired to believe mythology and not specific. Now, in your book, you say there are other myths. There's a sort of formulaic sure. sense if you have a checklist that sure. that'll add up to leadership. Talk about the other myths. Yeah, that, that was the first that sort of, if you do the right things or if you're born with the right traits, you're good. But when we studied the data, that's not true at all. Leaders who do almost everything right and have those traits often fail and people with none of them succeed. Then the second one was the attribution myth and that's the idea of the leader is the the fulcrum of it all that makes it happen or doesn't. The commander is the reason the unit's good or bad. But when we actually study that, we find that's not the case either. In fact, in many cases, the commander or the leader is part of it, but they're not at all the dominant variable. Context and followers just matter too much. And then the final one was results. And that's the idea that we are demanding people and we demand our leaders to be effective. We demand the CEO to produce profits. We demand the general to produce victories. You name it. But we don't. If you actually look at what we do to support leaders, to select, promote, follow, worship, we actually don't do that at all. What we do in many cases is follow people who take us exactly where we don't want to go or shouldn't go. And we don't Support people who produce exactly the best output we could want because leadership's a very emotional, subjective thing. It's an interaction between followers and that leader where the leader fills some need in people. And be, once we understand it's not at all objective, it's not clinical, it's very emotional, then suddenly a lot of other things start to to make more sense. Right. And often in retrospect, it becomes yes. clear. Yes. So what is the context today? I mean, you're saying it's not all about an individual. Yeah. It's not all about what we ask of that individual. There's a context that really matters. And yeah. today is all about incredibly rapid change. It's a pretty tumultuous time. Can you give us a snapshot of what you think a leader contends with? Let's not say military leader. In this yeah. case, a political leader. Yeah. We've got a bunch of people. We've got 23 people running on the Democratic side. It looks like only one on the Republican side. Yeah. Um, what is the context in which they hope to lead? Well, yeah, well, think about first the context in which they hope to run. In the late 19th century, you didn't run for office. You were put forward for office and then you stayed home. It was considered <laughs> unseemly to campaign. And so nowadays you're in a position where you not only have to campaign, you have to sell yourself. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of people, that's not a natural thing to do, to, to talk about, I have done this. This is, you know, because of me. Then the fact is, because you're against uh, an environment which is constantly changing and constantly judging, you're, you're shooting at moving targets. Yeah. You try to do things right, but what is right now is wrong 10 minutes from now or 10 days from now. And so suddenly what seemed like a good idea and was well accepted at a time is damned a little bit later. Mm -hmm. And because of the media environment, things happen so fast and they happen without a level of accountability, meaning anybody can make an accusation, whether it's media or someone who's amateur media, they, they can tweet or they can put things out. They have the ability to change the, the argument or change the position just by making either an accusation or or position. And so I think political leaders are in this vertigo. Yeah. And it's really hard to figure which way is up and which way to go is down. And we, as voters and followers and participants, are in a similar case. If you sit, sit us down and ask us what we want, we want character, we want predictability, we want consistency, we want things that I think are rational, but we respond to all the winds that are going in different directions and we respond in a way that is relatively fickle and often fairly uninformed. Yeah. And that makes it a very dangerous environment. Um, I would argue that 
there's always been the ability to do propaganda, disinformation, influence. And if someone 100 or 150 years ago did it, they either talk in the market square, they start rumors, or they might write a pamphlet like Tom Paine did, common sense. But their reach is pretty limited and it's fairly slow. Nowadays, it is lightning and it'd be constant drumbeat. And so I think that the, the power to influence how people think is many times more dangerous than we realize. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is, you say something often enough and people will either believe it or they will at least doubt what they do believe. And we're all, I think, pray to that. And, and so the ability to, to leverage modern information technology is something we haven't gotten our heads around yet. So that's the campaign. Picture the next president yeah. in office and he or she has asked you to come in and, and advise as to what is the single biggest threat to national security. Yeah. Um, in my personal opinion, the single biggest threat to national security is national stability. And so it is the divisions in our nation. Yeah. We have the physical ability, we have the talent to do almost anything needed in the world. But if we don't have the ability to put it together and do it, it's one thing to have an idea to have the best infrastructure in the world, but we can't make a decision to do it or we can't get enough compromise to do it, then it's irrelevant if we have the, yep. the physical capability. The German blitzkrieg tactic in World War II was not designed to destroy the enemy. It was designed to essentially cause the enemy's nervous system to stop working, their command and control. Our political divides essentially make our, our system stop working. Yep. And if it can't work, you can't solve basic problems. So if I, if I was going to address the single biggest problem in Afghanistan, it was confidence. In the United States, it's the ability to get things done, basically. And we, we're getting basic bills done. But the reality is no big things, in my view, the kinds of things that bring people together are, uh, are reflected right now. You know, you've been known for, and I've, I've followed your work in, in, in your effort to promote the notion of national service. Yes. What role would national service play in helping us come together? And I should note that I have a question here from a, a member of the audience asking whether you think women should be required to register for selective service. Yeah, I'll answer that first. Yeah, everybody should. Men, women, People with physical handicaps, we've now got the ability to get anybody to serve. And anybody should have the right to serve and everybody should have the responsibility to serve. No freebies. Thanks. Now I'm gonna preach on national service for a second because here's what I believe. Somebody asked me if we should have a military draft. And I said, well, yeah, I think we should so that we get everybody represented. But that's really not the question because we don't have a problem filling the military. I think we should have an opportunity and a social moral obligation to give every young person in America the opportunity to do a year of fully paid national service. It can be in health care, environment, can be in anything, education. And you say, well, why would you do that? We can hire contractors to do the work. It's not about that. If you think about what binds a nation together, it's the concept of citizenship. A nation is nothing more than a covenant between people. God didn't create the United States and draw out our borders. We put together the United States and people made an agreement to be together and you made an agreement in return for certain rights, freedom and protections, you have certain responsibilities. And we, we all signed up to that. And there was a time in the United States when locally those responsibilities were more tangible. Volunteer fire departments, defending things on the, on the frontier, raising barns. Those were really tangible because society wouldn't work without them. And as a consequence, people had a bond to society. They had a linkage between each other that was tangible and practical. And then you go to the big times in American history when we've been challenged big wars, particularly World War II. 16 million Americans wear a uniform. Everybody's impacted by the war. Everybody has a sense that they have contributed and therefore they own part of the outcome and they're responsible for it. I think what we've done is we've let the idea of citizenship erode until we think, well, I've got citizenship and that's something I got. 
It's my rights. It's something you can't take away from me. Most of us got it by accident of birth. We didn't do squat for it. We may have earned it later, but the reality is we didn't do much for it. There wasn't a test for it. But yet, that citizenship that binds us, that gives us a responsibility to each other is the most important thing we have. It's the thing that holds it together. But where do we learn it? I don't think you learn it in civics class. You learn things by what you do and the experiences you have. A lot of the things that I do better now than I would were not my choice. I fold my underwear in my drawer still, <laughs> which I would argue is important. Annie's not sure. <laughs> but I did it because for four years, people made me do it, and now it just seems right. <laughs> Extrapolate that and think about <laughs> what it is to be a citizen and take care of each other and, and be responsive. Um, I think what we have to do with national service is give people the opportunity to have an experience working with people from other zip codes on things that matter so that we produce alumni of that experience. We could start another world war and, and rely on that, but I don't think we want to do that. We can create an experience when young people have that, and it's a common experience. That right now, they have very few common experiences. If you've done national service in city year, AmeriCorps, you vote at three times the rate of your peers who didn't. You are more engaged for the rest of your life as a citizen. And I think that's what we need. And maybe if you serve with somebody from another political background or different race or different religion, then you stop thinking of them in quite the same way that you did. That's what I think we need to do. And somebody will say, well, everybody should just join the military. And I think you probably know this, but only 29% of young people in America qualify to enlist in the military. 71% can't enter the military if they want to for legal, political, physical, you name it, reasons, they can't. So 29% is the entire pool that has that opportunity. And think about what they walk away with. There's an awful lot of veterans in this room. Think about how you feel about yourself differently than you might have if you had never had an opportunity to serve. How many times have you been thanked for your service? Well, I would tell you there's probably 71% of the young people in America who will never hear thank you for your service of any kind. And what does that do to your psyche? So I, I think it's a completely apolitical idea. And I don't think it's a nice to do now. It's just, this isn't a bright idea someone came up with. I think this is something we've got to do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So from boxer shorts to cohesion, I'm, I'm going I'm to yes, stick with this. Now, I'm going to take you um, back to your book. If, if I might, because sure. not everyone's had a chance to read it, although I'm sure they're going to want to read it after seeing you. We've got a weekend coming up. you got a weekend. Come on, guys. <laughs> Women and guys. Um, you, you, you did do what Plutarch did with Plutarch's lives. You, you paired leaders mm -hmm. to show what they had in common. Um, and you started with, a, with a, a, a type, and it was the founder. And I have to start with that because he, he put together Coco Chanel with Walt Disney, and that's not that easy to do. So, so tell us, what were the characteristics, what were their attributes that made them leaders? Yeah, it's interesting because we looked at founders who created something out of whole cloth. And, and my admission is I didn't know Coco Chanel was a person when we started <laughs> the book. But interestingly, Walt Disney, ambulance driver, in World War I comes out, very talented animator, but more talented in pushing ideas and creating mm -hmm. something. He first uh, sound motion or sound animated pictures, but really in 1937 or 34 is the big one. He sends all of his employees home before dinner and gives them 50 cents. And he says, go eat dinner and then come back after dinner. They come back to an auditorium like this, and for the next three hours, he puts on a one-man performance, and he plays all the parts in a German folktale that would eventually become Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And then he tells them, we are going to do a full-length animated movie, never been done before. And we are going to not only get people cry, I mean laugh at cartoons, but actually get them to cry. They spent three years doing this work, creating it. He mortgaged the company, he mortgaged the intellectual property to uh, Mickey Mouse and his own home to finance it. 
And they produced in 1937, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And it's an amazing hit. His people just adore him. Four years later, they lead a bitter strike against him. And what happened was, here's a guy who's this extraordinary visionary, pushes, but could be really hard to work for. When he came to work, the, the guard at the gate would say, man in the forest. And what, what that meant was danger. And so what happened was a guy, as his, as his organization scaled, he had created these wonderful ideas, but he didn't scale his leadership to be able to run it. In fact, his brother actually ran the Disney Corporation for the last 20 or so years, and he focused on things like Disneyland and all. Coco Chanel was interesting, too. She, she starts as an orphan. She becomes a courtesan of some wealthy army officers, but she's a clever, hardworking woman who learns to sew. She gets financing to start a business, and pretty soon she realizes that the advent of World War I is going to change women's fashions because the heavy corseted kind of fashions weren't practical for people who had to work or for the cost. So she creates an entirely new kind of style, wears it herself, becomes the, the iconic demonstration of it, and then creates a huge empire. Again, not an easy lady to work for. You'd come to work and you'd have to stay, if you're an employee, you have to stand out front like an honor guard as you walk in wearing Coco Chanel fashions go inside, and then sometimes for hours she would stand chain-smoking cigarettes out of the corner of her mouth and using models as human mannequins. And they just had to stand there. But yet they, neither person ever had any problem getting people to work for them. Because people will tolerate a lot of friction and things like that in people they work for if they feel they're getting somewhere, not just the individual, but the organization. If they're part of something big, if they're part of something creating something special. And so founders, I think, create not only the reality, but they project a vision yeah. and mm -hmm. take us somewhere. So Steve Jobs would probably fit in there as somebody who had a clear vision but was not an easy guy. Absolutely. Yeah. So you have another category of, the, of geniuses. Yeah. And there you've got Leonard Bernstein, you've got, a, you've got Albert Einstein. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, we wanted to, to understand why people will follow geniuses, but why they don't follow all geniuses. Why just being smart doesn't make you a leader, and of course it does <laughs> We, we looked at Albert Einstein, and I always thought of the guy famous for his thought experiments where he could visualize things in his mind that we couldn't, as this lone genius who went in a room, figured stuff out, filled up a chalkboard, and then came out. Complete opposite. During his lifetime, he wrote 30,000 letters. He actually was the penultimate networker. He's always connecting different people in physics, pulling them together. Now, the physics community, at the turn of the... 20th century and for the next 30 or so years was actually a, a community that very much nurtured that kind of activity. But he represented it by always connecting and putting ideas. He really didn't come out when he came out with his two big uh, breakthroughs, the theory of rel special relativity and the general theory of relativity. Those were the last two big ideas he ever actually was right on. And yet, for the rest of his life, he created the community. People say that he wrote the famous letter to Franklin Roosevelt, urging him to develop the atomic bomb. One, he didn't write it. He did agree to sign it because he knew it would be helpful. But he had become a symbol. He'd become a leader as opposed to a doer. Mm -hmm. And Leonard Bernstein, same way, musical prodigy. But actually, his greatest skill was in making music accessible to people. He wasn't the mad genius. He was the kind of person who you thought you could be in the room with and actually understand classical music because Bernstein was so approachable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so I think genius is something, it's, a, it's a, a completely out of scale level of talent in something, whether it's brains or music or something like that. And it's frightening to us mostly and the genius of Einstein and Bernstein was to be able to make it connectable, relatable to us. Yeah. Uh, I know my, my mother telling me when I was a child that the way she knew that Einstein was a genius, she'd heard him speak, and she said he could make physics sound easy. Right. 
And he I could like, understand it when he... And he looked like your uncle, yeah. the rumpled uncle. <laughs> <laughs> so a surprising part of your book is, is your chapter on the zealots. Because one of them is Zarqawi. Yeah. The man that you ordered killed, that you, you were responsible for his death. He was the man you were fighting against. Talk about the zealots. Sure. We, we compared uh, Maximilien Robespierre of the French Revolution and Abu Musab al-Zarqawi. And Robespierre was a brilliant guy, zealot, but he did almost everything, staying in his rooms, writing out speeches that were then given out. He didn't give many speeches. He didn't actually stand up and say them. In fact, as he led the Committee for Public Safety at the height of the French Revolution, when in one five-week period, they guillotined 900 people, he never went out and took part in that. He never did the thumbs down. In fact, he never attended a guillotine until it was his own. Abu Musab al-Zarqawi was very different. He was a hands-on guy. We started fighting him when he appeared with al-Qaeda in Iraq in 2003 in Afghanistan. And my, my biggest memory, my first big memory, we were already after him, but they brought in a laptop to me in early 2004. And one of my guys said, sir, you got to watch this. And he puts the laptop in front of me, hits play. And there were five men dressed in black with black hoods standing in front of an American in an orange jumpsuit named Nick Berg. And this was a, a young man who'd gone and tried to find work in Iraq. And the, the gentleman in the center, the figure in the center in black, reads a statement. And then when he finishes the statement, he puts it away, and from in his robes, he pulls out a large butcher knife. He grabs Nick Berg by the hair, pushes him aside, and saws his head off. And it's all in the video. And I'm watching this thing. And in the moment, my hands clenched up. I literally had to consciously unclench him. And there were several things happening. The first was Zarqawi was shocking. And we realized over time that there were two messages. The first message was to us, our force, who was after him. And that was, you're not ready for this war. You're not ready to do what we're ready to do. Mm -hmm. Look, pretty powerful. The second message was to people in the region. And you say, well, this is terrible marketing. I mean, you're going to saw somebody's heads off and then say, follow me. But actually, it was it was very effective, and it was pretty bright. What he was doing was he was saying, look at all the leaders in the region who are autocratic, who bow down to the West. They're illegitimate. Look at those people who want change, and they put on a suit, and they go to the United Nations. How far did that get us? Now we're going to wear black, and we're willing to cut people's heads off for the purity of Islam. To reestablish the Islamic caliphate, we're ready to do anything. And if you think about it, at first you're repelled and then you say, that's actually pretty magnetic. We finally got somebody who's not messing around. We've got somebody who will take care of business. And it resonated through the uh, Islamic world, particularly among disaffected young men, in a way that, that most Westerners have a tough time understanding. It was his very, very zealotry. Zarqawi grew up in tough background, went to, got put in prison early in his life. And while in prison, he, he hardens himself. He becomes physically strong. He becomes absolutely pious. He wasn't very well educated religiously, but he was so committed, he would cover the TV so other inmates couldn't see it when there was a female on the screen. He would force everybody to be disciplined in their adherence to the religion. He had tattoos that he'd put on in his youth and they were haram or a violation. He tried to remove them with bleach, and when he couldn't, he had a razor blade smuggled in, and he cut the tattoos off. And when he did that, it was a symbol to every other prisoner because they could see that. Now here's a person who's more committed than I am. Ever been in a meeting with somebody who is so energetic, so focused, so committed? Part of you says, well, I'm not that way. But you go, wow, that's... You have a certain respect or awe for that. And we as followers have a willingness to follow it. And it's extraordinary how powerful it is. Now, it says something about the zealots. It probably says more about us. 
But that's important for us to pay attention to because that kind of leader who is outrageous, that kind of leader who is so focused, so over the top, is that white hot flame we all are attracted to. It must have been an extraordinary experience to write that, given that you saw this man as representing evil. Yeah. You ordered his, his death. Um, to be able to find something, I, I shouldn't say to, to admire, but to recognize and, and marvel at. Well, it's uh, interesting. It takes a lot of honesty with yourself. Yeah. Um, interestingly, I had sort of evolved from thinking of him as absolute evil. Mm -hmm. because I wanted to kill him, and we did. Um, And I don't regret that. But the reality was, as we had suicide bombers and we had these things, they were pretty darn committed. They were willing to die for their cause. And Zarqawi was certainly willing to give all for his cause. I mean, he, whether you liked what he was doing or not, he was completely committed to it. And, And we used to talk about this, which is sometimes dangerous for soldiers, but... What made me right and him wrong? What made my cause better than his cause? And while I believed in mine more than I believed in his, the reality was the willingness to admit that he had a position, he believed in it, and he was willing to to stand up for it, deserves at least respect. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't agree with his methods and all, but... I would say that uh, he taught me probably more leadership than anyone else I encountered because he made me think. He made me ponder what he did. And he made me adapt how I led inside my force. If leadership is defined by how many people will follow you, even when it's not in their interest, then yeah. this is a powerful example. It, you also wrote about uh, about leaders who were heroes. You talked about you wrote about um, or the sort of two more clusters um, of leaders. But I, I wanted to ask you about yourself as you look back at your career. And I bet you dealt with this when you were writing the book. Were there moments that you felt like, yes, I succeeded as a leader there? Yeah. That was leadership, and I'm proud of it. And are there moments where you look back and say? That wasn't leadership. <laughs> I'm not surprised. I'd love to have a do-over on that. Oh, yeah. Um, I think most leaders go through this. I would literally go through, you have very busy days. At the end of the day, you've probably had, I don't know, 150 interactions with people, sometimes young soldiers, sometimes people as you go around the battlefield. And even if you get it right most of the time, there are a percentage of times you don't. You react differently. You treat people poorly. You snap. You, do, you lose your temper. You name it. And on a practical sense, when you get very senior, what you have to understand is every person you run into is going to tell their spouse about the meeting that night. They're going to write an email home or call them or whatever. They're going to do that, particularly if they're junior, and they're never going to meet you again, so you're not going to get a do-over with that. And if you act like a jerk, they're going to say, Stan McChrystal's a jerk. (laughs) And they won't be wrong because that was their experience. Um, So there was a lot of that. Uh, I used to worry more about the times when I wouldn't perhaps make a decision or speak up when I thought something was wrong or something needed to be said. And if if I finished the evening, I'd go to my little hooch and I would... I would literally agonize over, you know, I should have mm-hmm. done X or, and I had not done, done that. And then occasionally you just make practical mistakes. Like once we had the British SAS worked for us and they did an operation north of Baghdad. And as they landed the helicopters to assault this place with Al Qaeda in it, they took a lot of fire, automatic weapons fire. So they brought in an AC-130 gunship and they destroyed the building. And that was the right answer. And I was watching on a video screen from a Predator downlink. And I said, okay, good. Next day, there were accusations. Civilians were in the building. So every time there was an accusation, I didn't believe it was true. We did an investigation because you just want to be sure. And you just do the right thing and you go through the process. And so we started an investigation on them. About 
I don't know, two, three weeks later, they were doing another operation to the west of Baghdad, and they landed near a house, and they took a hail of machine gun fire, and I said, okay, I'm waiting for them to destroy the building. And they didn't. And I'm watching. And then they did literally a frontal assault on the building. And I watched four operators, SAS operators, get dragged away by their comrades. I assumed they were dead. Turned out they were wounded. And then they assaulted it again. And I was beside myself thinking, what are they doing? And uh, I found out subsequently, although they never held me responsible, when I had implemented the investigation, American units understood that because they knew that was the standard operating procedures. The Brits didn't. They concluded the General Stan had two beliefs. One, they shouldn't use A-130, AC-130s. And two, he didn't trust them because he's now investigating them. <laughs> and I never explained it to them. Mm. And so they had done this second operation and taken those casualties because I had not communicated, which is my responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. And surprisingly, they've never you know, voiced a resentment. But you watch that and you just realize... I can cost people an incredible amount if I don't do my job. Yeah. So it sounds like most of the most of the regrets are sins of omission instead of commission. The, yeah. the, the moments when you didn't speak up when you thought something was wrong yeah. or you failed to communicate yeah. effectively. Is that a, a fair a fair judgment? Yeah. I don't, I don't so, have a lot of things I did that I go, I wish I didn't do that. Mm. There are some things that happened I wish didn't happen. Right. But... Uh, you know, I mean, treating people badly is, I guess, a sin of commission or something like that. But So I'm just going to ask you two more questions sure. um, from the audience. Um, and one, one asks, uh, some of us are devotees to U Ulysses S. Grant. Can you give your view of his leadership? Yeah. You've already told us that you, were, you had a, a powerful view of Robert E. Lee's leadership, but you had his picture up, and then you took it down. Yeah. So tell us something about that as well. As sure. Yeah, I'll start with uh, Lee. Uh, my wife, Annie, who's up here, gave me a picture of Robert E. Lee when I was second lieutenant, and I kept it hanging every set of quarters we lived in for 40 years. And I was proud to do it because I would look at it and think, that's a representation of leadership that I like to be associated with and will motivate me. And when people came in my house, to be honest, I was proud that they'd see that and they'd say, well, that's the kind of leadership Stan McChrystal believes in, and I did. Then after Charlottesville in 2017, Annie came to me and said, I think you ought to get rid of the picture. And I said, no, no, he, he wasn't political. He wasn't this, wasn't that. And she said, no, people come into our house there's a danger that they're going to think you believe in something you don't believe in. White supremacy. So we talked about it for about a month. And then I decided all on my own. <laughs> <laughs> and one Sunday morning, I took the paper or took the painting off the wall, went to the trash shop behind our house and threw it away. Now, I wasn't throwing Robert E. Lee away. Because Robert E. Lee was a complex character that was good and bad. He did a lot, he had an amazing number of good traits, and he made some great big mistakes. In the spring of 1861, in my view, when he decided to turn against his country and lead Confederate forces in the Civil War for the maintenance of slavery, he got it wrong. We can talk about it, we can argue about it. I think he got it wrong. And you know what I think that makes him? Human. I think he's flawed. I think I've made mistakes. I think he made mistakes. I don't think he tried to get it wrong. I think he just did. And there were a lot of forces pulling him that way. Um, I think Ulysses Grant is an extraordinary example of leadership. As we know, he had a much tougher row to hoe getting up to where he did than Robert E. Lee. I mean, Robert E. Lee actually had kind of a tough childhood. His father was a little irresponsible. But Lee, from his days at West Point, was really anointed and, and did a great job and lived up to people's expectations. Grant failed. He was a good young officer, did a great job in the Mexican War. And then after that, when he got in civilian life, he just stumbled for lots of reasons. And he had a very difficult time, obviously, with maintaining his own self-confidence because there were times when he literally had to beg his father or father-in-law for help. He had to do some things that most of us would find absolutely abhorrent. 
But when he got into command during the Civil War, there was a reality, there was a humility, there was a focus that was extraordinary. Uh, I think you know that in many ways people said he was the butcher, he caused the lives of so many Union lives to die because of the way he fought. But in reality, he was just trying to end it. He was trying to get it done. And he, he stopped going to hospitals, to field hospitals to visit wounded, because he found it too difficult to make the very difficult decisions he had to make to get the war done. You think about it, here's a guy with tremendous amount of human sensitivity and vulnerability, and yet he's got this understanding that he, he has got to get it done. The war is going on too long, and he does that. So I, I'm just an extraordinary admirer of him, realizing that he is all too human. I mean, he's, he makes as many mistakes as the rest of us and pays for most of them more than the rest of us have, but yet still rises above that. Uh, and then, of course, the final picture of him, he's made some bad investments after his time in the presidency and dying of throat cancer. He sits on the porch of his house on yellow legal pads and writes his memoirs literally sits there dying of throat cancer and writes his memoirs so his family would have money for their, the rest of their lives. Extraordinary courage doing that. And of course, he wrote a masterpiece in the process. Mm -hmm. I'm going to invite General Holy to come back, but I first want you to just say thank you to General Christie. Thank you so much, Joe.